Great. <clears throat> it's good having you once again. Um, this time around, I want to discuss um, the topic um, basic nursing procedures. Um, I want to use this opportunity to thank Paravatic Najib for this um, great initiative um, of introducing basic nursing procedures and um, EMS because of the hospital attachment. Um, usually this um, class is to be taught before uh, you begin hospital attachment so you can know um, the basic procedures that are done in the ward and how you can fit in well with other students that you meet um, on the ward so that you will not be left out. So by way of objective, by the end of the study, we should be able to explain what basic nursing procedures are, list some of the procedures, explain how to perform, example like wound care, explain the phases of wound healing, list and explain classification of um, wound healing. So introduction, basic nursing care represents the care that is recognized by patients as being the most necessary and important. And this was by Kitson et al. 2010. So those basic needs, activities of daily living that the patient recognizes as most important, these are recognized as the basic nursing care. It is dynamic. It's a dynamic therapeutic and educational process that serves to meet the patient's health needs. Okay, dynamic because it keeps changing, it's not static, and it's therapeutic. It's, it's, its target or its aim is towards healing. Okay, therapeutic. And it's in the form of education, you provide education to the patient. This involves the use of critical thinking process. So um, basic nursing care involves a lot of critical thinking. You need to think because you have to take decisions, quick decisions within a short period of time. And so you need critical thinking. Critical thinking involves problem solving and decision making, just as I explained. You, 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 you need to solve it. You have identified a problem that a patient is having. You need to find a solution to this problem. How can you do it? You need to make a decision. All these will involve critical thinking. And these are some of the procedures, dusting and bed making, a patient assessment, patient monitoring, drug administration, feeding of patient, documentation, bed bathing, oral care, wound care, disinfection, last offices. There are a whole lot, but I just sampled these ones to um, discuss. So dusting and bed making. Most often nurses don't like dusting. Not only nurses, other health workers don't um, like the dusting and run away from it. We need to find out, is it important to dust the ward? The main purpose of dump dusting is to remove dirt from all horizontal and vertical surfaces that might have settled throughout the night. So usually, Dusting is done in the morning by the morning staff. It's because um, that place has been left overnight. So bacteria, dirt could settle on those surfaces. And so you need to take them off. Why? Because of nosocomial infection. You, you can um, infect yourself. Bed making is the act of making a bed to remove dirt and germs from patient's bed. So uh, the aim of making a patient's bed, sometimes the bed, you can be walking around the ward and you see that the, the bed sheets have they formed creases and the patient is lying on it and nobody is paying attention. Sometimes these bed sheets can accumulate dead germs and, and, and the patient is lying on them. And these creases can um, cause pressure sores especially in unconscious patients. So it's very important to always straighten the patient's bed, make the bed so the beautiful 
envelope corners. These days, bed making has lost its beauty, but some of the facilities to ensure that you do uh, bed making right after dusting, you need to make the beds, uh, keep the, the room neat and clean to prevent germs from um, infecting the patient. There are so many types of beds we make in the hospital. Let's look at a few of them. The common one is the admission bed. The admission bed is performed to um, receive a patient newly admitted into the ward. So this bed, you make everything available for the patient because you may not know procedures that will be uh, performed for that patient. Um, operation bed, just like the word operation, is, 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 is prepared for patients who have gone in for surgery or patients who are going for surgery. So this bed usually, um, the main important um, component of this bed is to keep the bed warm because the patient is coming from theater and may have hypothermia. So you need to keep hot water bottles in bed to keep the patient warm from hypothermia. Um, cardiac bed. The cardiac bed is prepared for a patient with a cardiac condition. So usually this bed is uh, prepared. Uh, usually the patient is in a certain table, so you need a cardiac table. I'm um, sorry, it's in a certain position. The patient cannot lie down. Patient with cardiac problems, myocardial infarction, heart failure, and all these conditions, they cannot lie down flat. So usually dress or make cardiac bed for them. Then we have orthopedic or fracture bed. Just as a need, this, these kind of beds are prepared for uh, patients with fractures. Right. So orthopedic beds usually are, you see them in um, the teaching hospitals or facilities that have orthopedic wards. That's where you can see orthopedic beds being done. Okay. So admitting a patient into the ward. Admission is the process of receiving a new patient to an individual unit that's ward of a hospital. Right. So when the patient comes to the hospital and based on the um, assessment finding, the doctor may decide to admit the patient. Okay. How will you admit this patient into the ward? First of all, you need to receive the patient, welcome the patient, take the folder from the patient and check for order of admission. If there is no order of admission, you can't admit the patient. So the first thing is always open the folder and look at it. Is, it, is there an order to admit the patient? Introduce yourself, other staff, and orient the patient to the ward. This um, aspect usually we, we we neglect it. We may just introduce ourselves to the patient, but we don't orient the patient to the ward. So the patient needs to use the washroom. The patient doesn't know what to do. The patient needs basic information, doesn't know what to do. So orientation, when, once you receive the patient, introduce yourself, you need to orient the patient. Take the patient, let him know the washroom and where he or she can find um, other things that the patient may need. Assessment, yes, as we know, is a immediate uh, need, okay, of the patient, and um, you must take an action to meet this patient's needs. Um, we know these processes. I'm not going to waste so much time. You realize that nursing history is quite um, a bit different from. EMS history, but basically we still go in the same direction: airway, breathing, circulation, um, mental status, and then exposure. So, still continuing. After you've admitted the patient, so what? Done your orientation and all that. You begin your assessment. You've done your airway, breathing, circulation, and all that. You need to check the patient's baseline vital signs. So this includes the temperature, the pulse, the respiration, BP, blood glucose, all the vital signs. You need to check intake and output, okay? Especially if the patient um, has a cardiac or renal problem, 
measure the weight of the patient, the height, okay? Obtain history, obtain history from the patient. Usually you can get this history also from the patient folder, so just refer to and just ask a few questions to confirm what is in the patient folder. Take care of patient's personal property. This is very, very important. You need to receive patient's personal property. You need to ask them. Until the relatives come in, then you hand over these to them. You need to um, take in custody, keep them safe. Documentation. You need to record all these admission process, you need to write it down. Everything that you've done for the patient, document this process. You need to note, notify the kitchen, okay? Otherwise, this patient will not be fed. It's important. So the last aspect is to uh, make sure that you uh, inform the kitchen, right? Transferring a patient to another unit. Often we do it um, leaving the patient um, out of the process. The first thing to do is to explain to the patient and the family why the patient is being transferred. So for example, patient came in, was detained at the emergency, patient is stable, patient has been referred to the male or female ward, or patient's condition at the emergency um, may be a surgical, so they're referring to the surgical department. So you have to take time to explain this to the patient. Assemble all the patient's belongings, including the lab requests, medications, etc. Determine how the patient is to move. If you are to use, the, uh, use a wheelchair or the um, the trolley, whatever it is, make a decision and inform the patient. Collect all the client's medications. I mentioned that. Review the client's health records and check for completeness. It's very, very important because if you don't send, it's continuity of care. So you need to carry all the patient's records. Don't leave any of the um, records behind. Inform the receiving unit about the transfer. So we know this already because before we um, they refer a patient to a facility for the ambulance to send to, we always call the receiving unit. So before you move the patient to the unit, you need to, even though it's in the same facility, you have to inform them and they'll prepare a bed waiting for the patient so the patient doesn't feel stranded on the way. Document the transfer. So this is simple, right? This process is simple. How do we discharge a patient? Discharge process. Check for order that the patient need to be discharged. Check for it. It's very important. Sometimes it is also initiated by the patient. The patient can write a discharge against medical advice. So either the doctor gives the order that the patient is stable, patient can go home, or the patient can write, or the family can write, um, we don't want to continue care. Okay, so um, let us go home. Plan for continuity of care. Once patient is being discharged, it doesn't end there. You need to plan, review date. Um, need to the, the the community health nurses are supposed to know that this patient is being discharged and is coming into their community. And so when they are doing their home visits, they can visit this patient, and then um, this aspect has been neglected. So so. The public health department are not really doing it, but every patient who has been discharged and has gone home, if the patient needs follow-up, you need to refer this to the public health unit so that they can be doing follow-up. Contact family, significant other. Sometimes the relatives are not there, so you need to inform them that the patient has been um, discharged. They may organize their transportation or they may ask you to organize it for them. Before the patient go, you have to educate the patient. It's very important. You need to educate the patient about the condition. So pay attention to it. Look at what the nurses do. Patient education before they go. You educate them on their drugs, educate them on their food, educate them on exercise, 
So there are a whole lot of education going on. It's a skill that you need to learn. Learn how to educate patients. Educate them on their condition. Educate them on the medications they are taking. Educate them on um, uh, risk that they've been exposed to. Educate them on um, diet. Educate them on exercise, right, etc. So teaching a patient Right, so um, in teaching, it is not only limited to the uh, disease only or the drug that we mentioned, but we need to also look at the outcome. So some of the drugs, for example, let's say a diabetic with some insulin, insulin causes um, hypoglycemia. So lately we have a lot of diabetics collapsing because they take their insulin without eating. And so it's very important to uh, educate them on the outcome or the effects of their medication. What is the process of discharge? Do final assessment of physical and emotional status of the patient. Once the doctor gives the order, you need to assess the patient to confirm. Sometimes the doctor may have missed something very important. The fact that the patient has been discharged doesn't mean patients should automatically go home. The doctor or the nurse can miss something. So you also perform your assessment on the patient. Whatever you find, you can draw the attention to it. I have this, discovered this. I don't think the patient should be discharged or we need to review it. And when they review it and look at it, patient's life uh, may be saved. So don't neglect it. Check and return all patients' personal properties. So if the patient, you did not hand the properties or you kept them in the facility, make sure you hand these properties to the relative. I remember in the COVID center, um, one Indian, uh, what do you call it, died and he had a, a, a gold chain and a ring. And unfortunately, one of the nurses stole it. And when the family came to pick the body, they said they could not pick the body without it because that is the family God. So imagine the trouble that the nurse has carried. Indian God was what they are going to So be careful with patient property. Help the family and the patient to deal with um, business officers, accounting, paying their bills and all that. Write your discharge note, and then they can go. <clears throat> we'll look at personal hygiene. This is one area that um, we neglect often, care of personal hygiene, beginning with oral care. For example, the unconscious patient. The unconscious patients usually have mouth ulcers and they develop infections in the gum and all that because oral hygiene is not done properly for them. How do we do this? Its main purpose is to remove food particles from and around and between the patient's teeth. It also increases the patient's appetite, okay? Enhances the client feeling of well-being. If you wake up in the morning and you don't brush your teeth, you don't feel good in your mouth. Okay, so if you brush the teeth of the patient, the patient feels well. Prevent sores and infections, like I mentioned. Prevent halitosis, odor, bad odor in the mouth, halitosis. Good. Oral care is very important in the unconscious patient, especially the intubated patient. Patient who has been intubated and is in the emergency department for days. Don't say because of the ET tube you can't care for the patient now. You have to. So with this type of patients, we do the brushing of the teeth, rinse everything with a suction machine. So you need to learn this and then see how. It's very interesting because the patient is intubated, the balloon is inflated. So you are not afraid of 
um, fluid going into the patients, uh, what do you call it, trachea. So you can, but as you are doing this, you can be suctioning at the same time. Rinsing, you brush, you rinse, and the suction is in the pool in the water, so nothing goes down. Bathing and skin care. Is a bath or wash given to a patient in the bed who is unable to care for him or herself? So usually bed bath is done for patients due to weakness or pains. They are not able to bath and you have to bath for them. We have um, two main types of bathing. We have the complete bed bath. This patient is, um, uh, what do you call it? limited in bed, cannot get out of bed, cannot sit up, is unconscious. They need to bath the patient from head to toe. Then assisted bed bath. Assisted bed bath, just as the word goes, assisted. So the patient does the anterior aspect of the body where the patient can reach the hands, the, the torso, that's the abdomen, the chest, and then around the thighs and then the perineal area, the private parts, the patient does all those ones, okay? And then the parts, the back of the patient, around the bottles, behind the legs, you do that one for the patient. So where the patient can reach, you give the sponge to the patient, the patient bath those areas and then you will bath the other. So this one doesn't really have so they start from their face, their head, face, just like the way we bath. Okay. Then you come to the hands, then the chest, the abdomen, then the perineal area, the legs, then the hand over the sponge to the nurse or whoever is assisting, and then you complete the bath. Another important thing that most nurses have stopped doing now is treatment of pressure areas. Patients who are not able to get out of bed, unconscious patients, they develop pressure sores or bed sores. The bed sores occur because one, they either remain in the same position for a long time or two, the bed sheets have formed creases and the patients keep lying on them. Heat continuously cooks the skin, the skin begins to peel off and then the ulcers, okay. So, treating pressure areas does the following. It relieves muscle tension, promote physical and mental relaxation. Give yourself a massage and see how it feels if you have this mental relaxation. To improve muscle and skin functioning, to relieve insomnia so that the patient can sleep well insomnia, inability to sleep, to relax the patient, to provide relief from pain is very important, to prevent pressure sores, yes, equipitors, enhance blood circulation. So once the patient remains in one position for a long time, blood is unable to circulate. Good. Then we look at the next procedure, which is feeding the helpless patient. I know you have been doing these things, but you don't need to have an idea. During illness, trauma, or wound healing, the body needs more nutrients than usual. So there's, a, there's, there's increase in demand. There's increase in demand. Therefore, the nurse must be knowledgeable, sensitive, and skillful in carrying out feeding process. You need to look at the patient's disease process. There's increased demand for healing. And so look at it. Educate the patient's family on the type of food they should bring to the patient. Types of feeding. We have normal oral feeding. We have feeding through the nasogastric tubing, NG tube. Feeding through percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy, then parenteral feeding.
So, with a normal feeding, um, you just help the patient to take the normal food that the patient eats. Maybe the patient just needs to, to be helped to sit down, then you hand over the food to the patient. Or the patient is limited to the hands, so you just prop up the bed, head of the bed, and then you, what do you call it, encourage the patient to eat. Before feeding, always remember, especially oral feeding, always give the patient water to rinse the mouth. It boosts appetite so that the patient can eat what. So always give the patient water to rinse the mouth before feeding will continue. Feeding with nasogastric tube. You have to prepare the client and the feed. So feeding through NG tube. The patient must be propped up either sitting position or semi powerless and the food must be lukewarm or warm and the fluid and the food must be liquid in nature because it has to pass through the ng tube assess tube placement most often we just go pick the the ng tube and we start feeding the patient sometimes the the tube can dislodge okay the tube may be in the stomach but for some funny reason, the tube may dislodge and go into the lungs. So if you don't check for placement and you just come, you push in the light soup. The light soup is gone into the lungs. Patient will die. So attach a syringe to the um, to the open end of the, the NG tube. Anytime you're going to um, what do you call it? work on the NG tube, make sure you clamp it to prevent air from entering. Too much air entering into the stomach can lead to other problems. Aspirate the alimentary canal secretion. Aspirate it, pull it, redraw. So you connect the syringe, the 50 cc to the NG tube, then you take off the clamp, and then you pull back, you aspirate. The content that comes back into the syringe, you need to test it, okay? Most often, um, the pH tester is not there, so what do we do? You can pull it out, examine the content, examine the content. The other thing that you could do is uh, place your stethoscope over the stomach and then you push a certain amount of, uh, what do you call it, air into the engine tube and you hear this air rushing into the stomach. That's another way to test the placement, but this is, the latter is less practiced, less practiced. Before you feed the patient with the, um, through the NG tube, you must always assess re residual feeding um, content. It's very important. Is there left over in the patient's stomach? Maybe there is no motility, so patient is not digesting what you, you are feeding. So everything keeps sitting in the intestines of the patient. Patient may develop a serious complication. Patient will die. So before you feed, always aspirate. If it's 50 mils or more for an adult or 10 mils for an infant, do not feed. Do not feed consult the doctor or the nurse in charge before you can continue the feeding. So before you feed, always connect the syringe and aspirate. Once you've aspirated and you meet the requirements above, you can administer the feed to the patient. Before administering the feed, one, check the expiry date of the feed. Now, some of these foods are, uh, what do you call it, uh, pre-digested food, they are, uh, what do you call it, refined food that have been prescribed to feed the patient. Check for the expiry date. Light soup definitely, no expiry date, but the soup can get uh, bad. Your nose will be the tester, right? It's very important. Warm 
the feeding to room temperature. Rinse the patient's NG tube immediately before all the formula food has run through the NG tube. So, what this point simply means is that just as you serve the last bit of meal through the NG tube, as soon as the syringe is getting emptied, you don't want air to enter into the stomach of the patient. So as soon as the feed is about finishing in the syringe, use your clamp and time. As soon as the syringe is empty, you clamp the tube. Then you pour about 60 ml of water to rinse the food into the patient. You don't want the soup or the food to still be in the NG tube. People come in, see it, it doesn't look nice. So always use water about um, 60 mils to rinse through the tube. Clamp and cover the feeding tube. Once you are done with feeding, clamp it, cover it. Ensure client is comfortable and safe. You should leave the client in this position for hours. So after feeding, don't quickly lower the bed. Remember, we had to be propped up the head of the bed. Don't rush to dropping it down. Allow the patient in this position for at least 30 minutes. Why? You want to prevent aspiration. As soon as the patient lies down, everything falls back. Patient will aspirate and die. You can dispose of your equipment. Document the procedure. Monitor patient for any possible reaction, especially formulas. Patients react to formulas. So if the feed is a formula and you feed the patient, you need to monitor the patient for reactions. And we have what we call percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy. So some patients come with um, esophageal strictures or varices. Um, uh, varices, piles, okay, varicose veins of the esophagus or um, cancer of the esophagus or strictures. Sometimes the esophagus can narrow, become so strict, um, I mean, close that food cannot pass through, the patient cannot swallow, and tube cannot pass through. So the patient cannot eat normally through the mouth. So what they do is that they perform this procedure. They go into the stomach directly from the skin. They use endoscopy, view, and place this tube inside. Now in Ghana, we don't have the, um, you see, if you look at the picture to the right, that's a right tubing. Then to the left, that's a, um, a urethra catheter. That's urethra catheter. So in Ghana, most often we use urethra catheter. So if you see this type of tube in there, it is in the stomach. And that patient may have something we call esophageal viruses or strictures. So they place this there and feed. This type of feeding, you see, is very close to the stomach. And so you don't want to surprise the stomach. This can really trigger vomiting. So if you're feeding the patient through this, it is very important that the food goes in slowly. The food shouldn't be too cold. It shouldn't be too hot, especially too cold food. It can just stimulate um, the vagus nerve and then trigger vomiting. It's very, very important. So feeding through um, peg, most often we call it peg, peg. So if you hear them call peg, P-E-G, P-E-G, that's percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy. Good. The next one is tepid sponging. What is tepid sponging? Tepid sponging is the act of um, using tepid water to cool the patient's body temperature. Okay? Tepid or lukewarm water. The purpose is to lower the patient's body temperature. Usually, um, tepid sponging on the ward, traditionally we use, um, what do you call it, six face towels to do the tepid sponging. Um, you place all these, um, what do you call it, face towels in a bowl of lukewarm water. 
you squeeze one place on the patient's forehead, squeeze one place in the patient's armpit, so one in each armpit, and one in each groin. So you have one in each groin, one in each armpit, that's four, one on the forehead, that's five, and the last one, you use it to, I mean, dab the patient's body, leaving water on the patient's skin. So usually we do this for patients who cannot move out. But if the patient can walk up and down and the temperature is high, you can just advise the person to go in and take a shower. And after showering, he or she shouldn't clean the water. And that is tepid sponging. Indirectly, you have sponged that patient. We could also do tepid sponging for children. And for children, like I always said in vital signs, tepid sponging in children should be done from the feet. Don't forget that. Start watering their feet, then you climb to their knees, to their thighs, to their waist, to their abdomen, then you climb gradually before you go to their head. Don't surprise the baby or the child with water on the head. The child will collapse. Drug administration. Here, this is very important. We've done pharmacology, basic pharmacology. We'll continue with advanced pharmacology. Now, with drug administration, one key thing that you need to always remember is the rights of medication. The basic five rights. The right drug, the right dose, right dosage, right patient, right time. These are very, very important. You should never forget them. So it's part of the preparation phase. So pick your drug, steady, great. Create rapport with the patient. Assemble necessary equipment. For example, if you're going to give IV, you need to assemble. If it is a tablet, you need a cup of water. Some of the patients have water by them, right? Converting medications. This is a skill that you need to learn as an advance. So work closely with the injection room or the anesthetist. Learn how they convert the medications because we are going to be administering advanced medication that needs conversion. Conversion is very, very important. So ask the nurses, how do you convert medications? So a drug is in grams. How do I get milligrams out of it? A drug is in milligrams. How do I get grams out of it? So those conversions are very, very important. So ask them. They will show you it's a simple ratio formula. And then you can do the calculation. Else, when we meet in school, we can do this simple, simple, basic calculations. Calculating dosage as appropriate is very important always look at the dosage on the patient's folder on the prescription follow the rights of drug i already mentioned this use narcotic control some of the drugs are under lock and key like petidin like morphine these hard drugs like um, trauma door injectables always go through the process so the drugs are locked somewhere the keys with a matron, um, there's a book, dangerous drug book, they call it dangerous drug book. So pick this drug book, enter your name, enter the amount that you have taken, you sign. Okay, so anybody who comes to pick it, know that Mr. A came for two um, amples of morphine. Okay, so if there's a problem, you will have to answer. Wound dressing wound dressing. What is a wound? A wound is any break in the continuity or the disruption in the skin of the patient. There are four phases of wound healing. Homeost sorry, hemostasis, inflammatory phase, proliferative phase, this word is very difficult to pronounce slowly, proliferative phase and the maturation phase. So hemostasis like clotting, this is the first stage of wound healing and usually takes up to two days depending on the size of the wound. The main goal of this phase is to stop bleeding. Stop bleeding. So a clot is formed to stop bleeding. Then the second phase is the inflammation phase. This phase 
His main goal is to remove debris and bacteria from the womb. Okay, the main aim is to take away any form of debris. Okay, dead tissues. Debris are dead tissues. Bacteria, any foreign materials to get rid of them. It is characterized by pain. It's very painful. This stage is painful. The swelling, there's reddening, and there's heat. There's heat around the place. So these are the signs of inflammation. So sometimes a doctor or a nurse can ask you, what are the signs of inflammation? So inflammation is characterized by pain, swelling, reddening, and heat. May last up to six days. May last up to six days. Then we have the proliferative phase. The proliferative phase can be broken down into three sub phases. Filling the wound, contracting the edges of the wound, and then covering the wound. And this phase can last up to four days to almost a month. So filling the wound, there's a wound. Once the wound surface is clean, granulation tissue. So granulation tissues are just a collection. We call them granulation tissue. So you look at the wound surface and you see reddish tissue, pinkish tissues. That's what we call granulation tissue. It's a form of epithelial tissue mixed with capillaries and it's very vascular, it's highly vascular. So when you touch it, it bleeds a lot. It bleeds a lot because of the capillaries, okay? That is so to send adequate blood supply to the side so that healing can take place. So the first subface is the filling. So granulation tissues begin to grow to fill the wound. Then the edges of the wound begin to come together and that's what we call the contracting edges. And the last part is what? The covering of the wound. Then we have the maturation phase or scar formation stage. That's the last stage, maturation phase, scar tissue formation. So more protein called collagen is deposited on the granulation tissues that are forming. And as this protein, it, it provides strength, is deposited on these tissues, then scar formation. Wound healing can be classified into three. We looked at the phases. The phases are like stages. But this one, we are looking at the classification of wound healing. Wound healing can be classified into three basic headings. First class or first intention healing, second intention healing, and third intention healing. So with the first intention healing, usually, these are surgical wounds, surgical wounds, operated wounds. So the wound has minimal tissue loss. Okay. Okay. There's no open wound. Even though there, there's an incision, but the surgeon, the surgeon or whoever, uh, what do you call it, sutured. Maybe it could be a lacerated wound. And then the patient was brought to the hospital and then you did suturing. Once you do suturing and you bring the edges together, you clean it nicely, that wound will heal by first intention healing process. So usually first intentions are surgical wounds. Then we have the second in, uh, second second or secondary. 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 Second or secondary. Occurs with tissue loss, like a laceration. Laceration is an example. Such as a deep laceration pen, pressure source. Now these sores, if they are not sutured, once they are sutured, like a deep laceration, if it is sutured, then it becomes primary intention. But if it is not sutured, the wound edges are open. They are not together. They are not closed. So this type of wound will heal with granulation tissues filling the wound and then scar forming. 
phase of cartridge one. Then we have the last phase, which is the um, third or tertiary. Third or tertiary. Okay, so when there is a delay in the time between the injury and closure of the wound. Delayed primary wounding. So third intention or tertiary is delayed first intention healing. Let me repeat again. I said a third intention healing is delayed um, first intention healing. So let's say there's a surgical wound. Okay, a surgical wound that is infected. That is infected and opened so because of the infection you see some of these wounds in the in the ward because of the infection they normally leave the wound open they leave it open then after uh, granulation or the infection is gone then they go back to do uh, what you call it resuturing of the wound and that is what we call tertiary so you see it in the world mostly it's in the surgical world mostly mostly it's in the surgical world what is the purpose of cleaning the wound to keep the wound clean to prevent the wound yes from injury and contamination to keep in position drugs applied okay to keep in position so dressing, it should be dressing, uh, cleaning and dressing of the wound. So the dressing of the wound will uh, provide comfort, prevent injury and contamination. Okay. The dressing will also bandage the medicine in place. And also helps to keep the edges of the wound immobilized together helps to keep the edges of the wound together. Procedure. You need to explain the procedure to the patient. You need to clean your trolley, assemble your sterile equipment on top and the um, unclean ones down. Okay? So usually dressing, but most of the walls don't have this dressing trolley, so they just use a tray, kind of, and put everything in there. But the proper dressing trolley we have the top shelf and the bottom shelf so the top shelf is sterile the bottom shelf is not sterile so anything that is not sterile goes down and the top is only for sterile things so you may be asked to go and prepare a trolley for wound dressing you may be asked all you need to do is to go and put on your gloves clean the trolley very well clean the top really really well because that's where that is going to be what sterile the down you clean it but you put the change that the items that are not sterile down there so top usually we put only our kidney dishes or our dressing set we put the dressing set on top drape and put patient in the comfortable position so you need to position your patient very well place rubber sheet and its cover under the affected side. It's very important to protect the patient's bed. Okay, so place rubber or a Macintosh under the patient's leg. Remove the outer layer of the dressing. Remove the outer layer of the dressing, especially the bandage or the adhesion tape. Remove the inner layer of the dressing using the first sterile forceps and discard both the soil dressing and then the forceps we don't throw the forceps away but we keep it aside because it's gone into contamination so we don't want to bring it back again take the second sterile forceps here yeah, most often want to use the surgical gloves so they don't even use instruments so if you're using your hands once you are wearing your sterile gloves then you can go ahead Clean wound with cotton balls soaked in antiseptic solution. So for 
um, surgical wounds, we clean it with alcohol. Some facilities use providence solution to clean it. So depending on the hospital protocol, learn it. Surgical wounds that have the edges close together, use alcohol to clean it. Again, use the second forceps to clean the skin. So we clean the wound, especially a clean wound, we clean it inside out, inside out, meaning that you have to clean the inside of the wound first before you clean around the wound. And once you use a cotton ball and you dump or you dab once, you throw it away. Sometimes you see that uh, some nurses we use one um, uh, uh, cotton, so dab here, dab here, dab here, dab here, pull here, then they put, then they take another one, pull here, pull here, pull here. It's not good. It's not the best practice. So get enough cotton. Dab, dab, throw away. Dab, dab, throw away. Right. Apply medication, if any. So with the surgical wounds like this, most often we don't apply anything. Once you clean with alcohol, just put gauze on it, dry gauze on it, and tape it. Some of them want medication. One important care that we need to look at as um, is very important to us at, as advanced trainees. Um, the perioperative. Um, <clears throat> if, you are in, if you are in a facility that does not have a theater, Okay, you are going to lose a lot. And so if you're thinking of relocating to a facility that has a functioning theater, why? Because uh, you need to learn advanced medications. You need to learn intubation. In those hospitals, they don't have adrenaline. They don't have propofol. They don't have ketamine. So the drugs, they don't have them. And this is the opportunity for you to learn how to mix those medications. What do we use to intubate? Okay, so please, I'll entreat you to work closely with the nurse anesthetist and then the, uh, what do you call it, theater nurses. Work closely with them. Work with, um, um, yes, any other staff that works really well in the theater. You will learn a lot. So perioperative refers to um, in the operating room, okay, area. So perioperative care is the care given to the patient before, during, and after surgery. So let's look at the perioperative. Pre, preoperative. Let's look at the preoperative, not peri. Preoperative. Pre means before. This is the care given to the patient before surgery. Its purpose is to prepare. Its purpose is to prepare patient emotionally, mentally, physically for the surgery. Patient, if not emotionally stable, can die on the theater table. Okay, patient who are mentally not stable will deny the surgery. They will say they will, they will refuse the surgery because they are afraid. Physically, if the patient is not um, physically fit, surgery cannot take place. To prevent any complication before, during, and after surgery. This is another important component. Okay? You want to identify and prevent any complication. Review pre-anesthesia screening report. Every patient who goes for surgery goes to the, there's a department called the anesthesia department. Now they screen all these patients. So when they come, open their folder, read the anesthesia report. Now this report helps identify any possible risk the patient may be exposed to in surgery. This assessment identifies the best type of anesthesia for a patient. Otherwise, you will give a wrong anesthesia and patient will fight the surgery. 
ask of blood thinners during um, what do you call it this process that you are preparing the patient ask the patient if the patient is on any um, anticoagulant we call them blood thinners they make the blood thin anticoagulant like aspirin okay like warfarin these drugs heparin they make the patient bleed so if the patient is on any of these you need to document it and report to the surgeon or the nurse in charge. Allergies make it known. Fever. The patient who has fever, fever is a sign that there's an infection or inflammatory process going on in the patient's body. You cannot do the surgery. Patient with catar, you can't do the surgery. So you need to assess the patient for all these things. Most often we don't do it. The patient just come, you just receive them. Uh, for no matter how, then no. We need to go through all these processes, right? Let's look at intra, during surgery, during surgery, intra. Intraoperative nursing care is in two parts. The scrub nurse. The scrub nurse is the sterile nurse. This nurse um, scrubs or cleans himself or herself thoroughly gets gowned and assists the surgeon to perform surgery so if you are in theater those who gown and help the listen are called the scrub nurse then another important nurse or duty is the circulating nurse the circulating nurse must be more experienced than the scrub nurse. I repeat, the circulating nurse must be more experienced than the scrub nurse. But most often we make it, we turn the tables round. Why do we say that? If the most experienced nurse is scrubbing, the circulating one may not know what to do when there's a need to pick something bring this then he's looking somewhere and as you know the best observer is the one who stands at the side and is watching so the circulating nurse stands and observe everybody's role if the surgeon is making a mistake he must observe and prompt if the scrub nurse is making a mistake anything that is going on wrong the circulating nurse also monitors together with the, anest uh, the nurse anesthetist or the anesthetist uh, patient vital signs on the monitor monitor so the circulating nurse must be very very good so learn all these roles and then i'll be happy if some of you are able to scrap and assist in surgery they will do it if you, I mean, uh, prove that you are willing to learn. They will let you do it. Perform errands, like I said. Observe everyone for errors. Focuses on the monitor. So the circulating nurse plays a very important role. It is not given to anybody. It is not given to anybody at all. Then we have the post-operative care. Post-operative care is a care given after surgery usually monitoring is basically monitoring the purpose is to prevent any complications from anesthesia and to detect any sign of post-operative complications nursing interventions include monitoring the vital signs the airway patency mental status of the patient managing pain assessing the incision site for bleeding assessing and maintaining fluid and electrolyte balance these are very very important key things the um, nurse or the emt in the recovery ward must do this is the recovery ward work so you monitor the vital signs every five minutes for about 30 minutes or one hour then you monitor the vital signs every 15 minutes for one hour then you monitor it every 30 minutes for the next hour. Then you now switch to um, 
four hour live vital signs. The BP is very important. Some of the anesthesia, especially spinal anesthesia, can cause rapid hypotension. Rapid. So you need to focus on the patient's vital signs. If BP is dropping suddenly after surgery, you need to inform the anesthetist. And the best drug they administer is called ephedrine. Ephedrine to raise the BP. So quickly read it. It's a vessel constrictor. Vessel constrictor. Alpha agonist. Read it. Okay, read on it. Ephedrine, ephedrine, ephedrine. Airway potency, very important. Mental status. A patient who is becoming hypoxic. Sometimes anesthesia can make the patient, as the patient is coming around, the patient will be um, disoriented. Good. There are three phases of the post anesthesia phase. Phase one is patients emerging from anesthesia. So this is where the patient is just waking up from anesthesia. This phase is very, very vital. Patient becomes confused patient doesn't know where he or she is and so you must make sure that the side rails are in place once you see the patient begins to move you have to quickly go to the patient and you have to restrain the patient the hands if you don't do that they are going to pull any tubing out they may extubate themselves they may remove their cannulas they may anything that is on there that is not comfortable urethra catheter even the surgical site, they may just damage everything. So you need to protect this patient. It's very, very important. Then the second phase, the patient is becoming stable. The patient is breathing well. Pulmonary is functioning well. The BP good. Heart rate is fine. Patient is hemodynamically stable. There's enough urine production. So patient is ready to move. To the ward. Then the third phase, patient usually is on the way to the ward. So it's the same continuous monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. This is targeted towards healing. So there are three phases. The most important is the first phase. Then I want to talk about care for the dying, what we call last offices. It's a death. It's a natural part of life and comes to all beings. It's the end of life and all vital processes. There are stages of dying. Stages of dying. It's just like stages of um, griefing. So denial. This is the initial stage and the patient often deny it. The patient comes to defense. No, I can't die. I can die. So quickly identify this. If the patient is denying, you need to help the patient because one of the rights of the patient is that the patient has a right not to die alone. Okay, the patient has a right not to die alone. So you have to go through this process with the patient. The second stage is often anger. The person has defended it is not working the person gets angry so the patient may become violent patient may be rude towards anyone at all who comes near even the family members he doesn't want to see anybody you don't understand the patient is angry that he or she is about to die we should put ourselves in the patient's shoes and then help the third stage is bargaining. The person attempts to strike a bargain for more time to live or more time to be to be without pain in return for doing something good for God. So over here, if the person didn't have any good connection with God, the person now begins to bargain with God. Please give me one more chance. I would when if you give me this chance. I'm going to serve you better. I'm going to, I mean, visit the prisons. I'm going to, and all that. The patient is just trying to buy time. The fourth stage is depression. 
bargaining fails, the patient becomes depressed. Usually, when people have completed the process of deny, denial, anger, and bargaining, they move into depression. They move into depression. Kindly ignore the three, two, three, four, two. They move into depression. Patient has bargained. Nothing is yielding fault. Patient move into depression. The final stage is the stage of acceptance. After depression, patient has no choice but to accept his or her fate. This is the care given to that the last office is the care given to the body, the dead body after death. It is also called postmortem care. Postmortem care. What is the purpose? You want to show respect to the dead. You want to prepare the body for burial. You want to prevent spread of infection like COVID. To show kindness to the family of the patient. Okay, these are the purposes. What do you need? You need a basin of water, you need cotton gauze, dressing tape, clean sheet, treacher, forceps, name tag, gloves, mide, a body bag. Note the exact time the patient died and document it. If the, if the doctor is present, call him to pronounce it. We will do CPR. The CPR, there's no efforts, patient is not coming back, and that is it. If the family members are not present, send for them. It's important, send for them. Send for them. Wash hands and wear clean gloves according to police, uh, hospital policy. You need to provide privacy. Close all doors and windows, privacy. Raise bed to comfortable working level. Arrange for privacy, privacy and prevent other patients from seeing in the room. Sometimes the patients are lying side by side. Once they know the other patient is dead, it's difficult for them to stay there. I don't know why everybody fears death, especially when you are sick. And you are, I remember one arm. Um, man in Kolebu. Uh, he was the fifth patient in row, and unfortunately, the day he went there, the first patient on that side died. The following day, the next died in that order, coming, coming. So the fourth day, the other patient died. So the fifth day, in his turn, he said, the fourth day, he said, Mene, be Meaning that today I'm not sleeping here. Hey, if I sleep here tomorrow, I'll be the one dying. And he discharged himself that day. <laughs> yeah, just that just by the way. So it is important to arrange uh, for the patients, the family, okay, to come and look at it, and then to prevent side or nearby patients from seeing, they become afraid, they become uncomfortable. How do we do last offices? Trainees always fear last offices. Close the eyes of the patient and plug the nose with cotton ball. Okay. If the mouth of the patient is open, support it with gauze bandage. So you tie the jaw to the head to close the mouth of the patient. Drain urinary bladder by pressing around the um, symphysis pubis. Drain it. Drain it. Once you press the the sphincters are all lax, so the urine will come out. Place patient in the supine position. Place soil dressing with replace soil dressing with clean ones when possible, bath the patient. But this, we don't do it these days. When the patient is dead, bathing, no infection prevention, you just remove the clothing, do this, 
and cover the wounds. If the patient has wounds, cover them nicely. Um, pressure source, cover them. Okay. Brush and comb the hair nicely. Comb the hair nicely. Apply gown on the patient. This is, the gown is not there, so we use a body bag. If there's no body bag, um, to keep the body in shape, you place the arms on the abdomen of the patient and you tie them together. And then you keep the legs two together and then you tie them together. Why do you do this? You want to keep the body in um, what do you call it? Straight position. If the hand is bent and it's not straightened, um, right mortis sets in and the arm cannot be straightened again. Care for the valuable of the patient, the belonging document, and then give to the patient relatives. Puts label identification band on the patient's arm or leg. Allow the family to come and pay last respect. Let them come and view the, the body and leave them alone with their family member. Leave them there. If the person belongs to occult and the members come there, you have to give them that opportunity to do their last respect. Attach special level if patient had contagious disease like covid will not want the relatives to come in there we know the process arrange transfer to the mock so usually we call the mortuary and then they come in remove gloves wash your hands and document procedure